Welcome back to our panel discussion, Digital Modernization in DOD's Fourth Estate, sponsored by Lidos here on Federal News Network. My guest today, Pat Flanders, the Chief Information Officer at the Defense Health Agency, Frank Konechny, the Chief Technology Officer at the Air Force, Jamie Markhole, the Chief Information Officer at the Defense Contract Audit Agency, Don Means is the Defense Enclave Services Executive at the Defense Information Systems Agency, Danielle Metz is Principal Director for the Deputy Chief Information Officer for Information Enterprise at the Defense Department, and Doug Jones is the Chief Technology Officer of the Defense Group at Lidos. And in this gigantic five-year effort to consolidate and optimize and improve the, and lower the cost of, by the way, of the infrastructure supporting the fourth estate, it seems to me that one of the biggest issues is getting it done through the people that you have. And so there's a lot of human capital, cultural changes, maybe a cliche, but I think it's a real phenomenon. So Don, why don't we start with you? What are the human capital, organizational, and programmatic issues and challenges that you see to making sure this goes and moves apace? Yes, I actually think that, uh, you know, programmatically and technically um, that, you know, there, there may be some small challenges that we'll be able to overcome. Uh, but I think on the human capital side, you know, that is actually the greatest asset. We can't do any of this without uh, the people. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a change, you know, uh, for some of the agencies, you know, changing the logo but in and of itself, even though you might be doing the same job, uh, can be traumatic. And I think uh, things like having uh, town halls and uh, over communicating with people to make sure that they understand, uh, you know, what their role is in the bigger picture, how they're going to be uh, supporting uh, the same mission requirements. Uh, it will be important uh, to make sure that they're able to, um, you know, provide, um, you know, the services that they're, they're very good at providing. Um, so I think that the human capital side of it um, is going to be a challenge just from, uh, you know, just because change is hard and it's going to be different. Frank, I imagine there's just issues with everyone speaking the same language because it may vary across different agencies. I think that happens even within the Air Force across the different bureaus and pieces. Well, it's interesting because every Air Force base is unique into itself. And so this is like the, the fourth estate is the same way, exactly. And so when you talk about consolidation and everything else, it's, it's the same, if, same issues. You have cultural issues. You have, I want this because I'm doing this, you know. And so depending on your mission that you have, it has to be adjusted. And you have to understand when you combine everybody together, you have a bunch of people who have different missions and have different needs. And this is one of the problems. It's not vanilla across the board. It's pretty much, you know, a mix of things. And when you combine them together, you have to realize that and understand that when somebody says, my mission is blah and it's important, you're going to hear that 30 times. <laughs> and they yeah, all are important. That, sure. Danielle, is that part of the thinking that has gone into this? I mean, do you take this into account in planning this effort? Oh, absolutely. I think the, the first step is to ensure that you create a collaborative environment, a forum for the dialogue to take place, and so that each of these DAFAs has an ability to be a part of the solution. They're, they see themselves represented in the strategy moving forward, and you have buy-in at different echelons. It also requires to have persistent, dedicated leadership, and this is an enduring effort. Uh, reform needs to be constant. And so therefore you have to make sure that you have leadership in each echelon that is pushing this forward. And as Don said, that you're over communicating. I don't think there's a problem with over communication. You have to be able to um, be able to vocalize and also listen and then be able to create that dialogue. Um, Technology is easy. People are hard and that's okay but you need to be able to create the, the safe space for them to be able to communicate and for you to listen so they can see themselves represented in the strategy that you're putting forward. And Pat, having made a lot of change already within what is a very large and diverse agency, how do you, or do you worry about having to go over ground you've already gone over? And how do you deal with what your people are telling you as you go through all these multiple projects, including your participation in this particular fourth estate effort? So that's one of the reasons I come in towards the end. And so this is a very real thing, right? So when you subsume something, so I, I got an Air Force thing 
an army thing, a navy thing, and I already had a Tricare management activity thing. So I own four of everything, right? And so there's four sets of people for everything. Well, in the army, a lot of their workforce is government. In the navy, you have the same people doing those jobs, but they're contractors. And in the air force, you've got more military. That's all gotta be worked out when you migrate four into one along with the contracts because we'll pick a facility that's 80% contractor and 20% government. Well, you can almost outsource all of the commodity IT there because it's 80% contractor. But if it's the other way around and they only have say two out of 10 people that are contractors, those contractors are, are not gonna go in there and tell those good government people how to do business. They're gonna augment and help them. And so all of that stuff and it's by site, by location, very important got to be worked out and we we're doing it we're about 70 percent through it for the medical stuff sure well uh, jamie why don't you comment uh, from the stand up standpoint of the dcaa because you are dealing with all of those different makeups in the agency's contracts that you do audit and so forth so how do you handle that kind of thing now well in terms of cultural change for dcaa i look at it in two two angles and um we do have a mix of both government and contractor IT people performing our services. But I look at it, um, I'm always focused on the, on the end state customer, which is our auditor workforce. I'm hoping it's relatively seamless for them. Um, they just want capability, they want to be able to do their job. And with the consolidation of tool sets that's likely to occur once uh, we have a single service provider, we may have to make some adjustments in terms of training employees, uh, they're going to have to be adaptable to potentially using a new capability that replaces what they're comfortable with. But I think that will happen and not be too too much of a burden. I think where the, my biggest challenge is with my own internal IT organization, we're going to suffer the brunt of the change. We have a large percentage of our government staff will be transitioning to DISA, you know, per design. And those folks have concerns about, you know, what their new organizational structure will look like what their new responsibilities will be, who's their new supervisor, normal human concerns that people would have. Um, and then the remaining people that I have post DISA migration, uh, we're going to cover down and focus on our mission systems, which is a good thing. The challenge is many of the folks I have uh, on the Gov side span both mission and commodity IT. And so how do I separate them, retrain them? Uh, it's going to cause some, some challenges all overcomable, but I, I think we'll have more difficulties adapting on the IT side than our agency at large. At least that's my hope. Yeah, Doug, it seems like that's one of the challenges also from a vendor standpoint is you do have the mission systems that vary greatly, and yet the commodity IT, in, in theory at least, it doesn't matter if it, if, it's, if it matches all across these different small sub-enterprises because the functions are exactly the same. So how do you approach that one? It is a challenge, and, and you know, we look at this from a mission IT and commodity IT because they come together, right? In the end, we use a lot of that sort of commodity IT to make decisions that are critical to the mission, right? The data goes across them as we're doing that situational awareness. So you know, it is that balancing act as we go across. You know, I think ultimately some of the key challenges we have, as Daniel said, it's, it's less about the tech and more about the people and the culture and making sure we, we have effective collaboration, you know, that the... The agencies involved have, have a voice in terms of the capabilities they get. And, and the other thing is that customer experience. How do you ins ensure we're still getting that customer satisfaction to the user community that they feel their needs are being met when you're optimizing and consolidating these capabilities into a central place? That's the big fear we've seen on the commercial side. We've seen other agencies as we do consolidation is, is still making sure that they feel that they're, they're getting their needs met. And people know when, when someone calls that they understand the priority based upon that org and where they're coming from, because you don't know their mission necessarily because you're a large organization supporting a massive you know, pool of people. How do you know how to prioritize those pieces and that this isn't just someone calling to get an access fixed, they're a doctor that needs their access fixed so they can get something done or they are uh, you know, an auditor at a field audit that needs that support. So how do you balance those pieces of the challenges? And that's you know, where I think we can, we can partner with, with the government and industry to make sure that we're bringing that best of breed solutions to bear for that. 
Yeah, Danielle, it strikes me that one good crucible for this is the help desk. You mentioned that there were 35 of them across these different enterprises, and you'd like to consolidate that to a single help desk. And that seems like almost where all of the issues would be concentrated, because the help desk has to support this broad range of services, and the help desks themselves may have operated totally differently coming together in this. So maybe expound on that one. Certainly. So the idea is, is that this is a contract award. To, it's a global service center contract. And the idea is that this is going first. So this is consolidating a lot of their service help, a service help desk that they have internal to DISA, whether it's supporting DISA itself or DISA as the enterprise service provider um, for, for the Doden. Uh, we have 13 organizations that would follow suit. And the idea is, is that as part of the civilian transfer piece, instead of having those individual folks who were manning those individual service desks, they would transition to DISA. Um, so that now, instead of focusing on individual piece parts of the network, you're now focusing on servicing the new DOD network for the DAPAs. Um, so it goes uh, hand in hand in terms of having, making sure that you have the contract in place, that you have all the right uh, tools in place and the services to be consolidated, optimized, and then the people piece follow after that. And so that is a very methodical approach. So as uh, the networks are being optimized into the new network, so too will six days before that happens, the civilians would transfer to, to DISA. Um, so we're, we try to be, um, to create a strategy where it would make sense. And we took a lot of input from the DAFAs before we finalized that and put those implementation plans into work. So Don, you probably won't be giving out your personal number to all the people that might be calling the help desk. But I wanted to ask you about something we mentioned earlier, and that is agencies that may have made some optimization and transfers already. And the need might be to change what they've already changed. I'm thinking in terms of cloud, as DISA has helped teach the world, cloud migrations are a lot more complicated, take a lot more planning than simply switching over the lift and shift type of workload model that everybody thought we would have 10 years ago. And so a lot of agencies have done the heavy work of establishing cloud provisioning, uh, you know, contracts at different levels, the, the uh, infrastructure level, the hosting level, and so on. How do you see the possibility of retaining what they've already done uh, in this new regime that's coming? Well, I think uh, you know part of that it, it goes back to communication with the different uh, agencies and field activities to make sure that whatever they're building is consistent with the technical approach and where we're heading. And uh, you know, Pat can attest to this. Uh, you know, we provide a multitude of forms to make sure that we're hand in glove because the worst thing that could happen is for uh, investment or build out to happen in a direction that we, that we don't intend to go. And so uh, again, through Danielle, uh, through um, you know, our uh, current uh, senior staff at DISA, uh, we're making sure that we're having a close partnership with all the CIOs and directors so that we're all have the same site picture and we're all marching uh, towards a convergence and not not divergence. Um, it's one of the big lessons learned uh, going forward. Um, I did want to touch on the help desk piece of things because um, ultimately uh, that's the part that I really get excited about. I, I want to um, help enable a better user experience for just the average user for each one of these agencies. And you know, I think if we do all this investment and we optimize, yet we have a less productive user experience at the endpoint with uh, simple things like laptops and phones that, that really uh, have, haven't done it right. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about that piece of it. You know, uh, we, we really would love it to end up in a place where, um, you know, this is uh, not only exhibiting best practices, but also has created a, a much more productive user, user experience across the entire fourth estate where you're not you know, stuck with a piece of broken equipment that we can quickly turn it around or where you'd be able to go anywhere on the fourth estate and use your equipment because ultimately it is one network. Yeah, Doug, uh, I wanted to ask you that question also. Should and is it, is it possible and efficacy to, to have an endpoint strategy as kind of the final piece of all of this consolidation and optimization? Because if someone wants to put their Game Boy on the network, then you got a problem. 
Wow, I think we all just dated ourselves there. But uh, yeah, I completely agree. I, I think um, I think the endpoint strategy is absolutely critical because in the end, that's one that's where the rubber meets the road from a user experience, from a security perspective. Um, so it's absolutely critical to have that. Now we have to have flexibility there. We can't say everyone's going to use this model laptop, period, right? Because there's different needs and, and different modes out there. But I think as Don was bringing up, we have to make sure we have that user experience where we're able to get them the tools they need to do their job. But I think some standardization and optimization around that, around personas that we would see out in the normal workforce in terms of the, the types of, of, of demands they need, whether it's a, a desktop, whether it's a laptop, whether it's classified versus unclass, and, and things like the amount of CPU you need if you're doing like engineering modeling and sim type stuff, like over at DARPA they may be doing. Uh, you know, those are gonna be a little bit different configurations, but I think going to a standardization, the imaging, the collaboration tools, and the security are gonna be really powerful to give that user experience Tom was talking about, to give you portability across the network so you can go into other places and to give you an improved buying power from our ability at, at the overall uh, fourth estate level, I think will be really powerful and allow us to also have better resiliency because we'll have some standardization so we can be able to get you return to service much faster because it's able to better able to stock sort of backups and be able to jump in and give you a new resource if you need it from a learner perspective. All right. I think we're going to have to end on that note. We are out of time, but I'm glad we were able to cover everything from the cloud to the endpoint today and everything in between. I want to thank today's guests, Pat Flanders, the Chief Information Officer at the Defense Health Agency, Frank Konechny, the Chief Technology Officer at the Air Force, Jamie Markhole, the Chief Information Officer at the Defense Contract Audit Agency, Don Means is the Defense Enclave Services Executive at the Defense Information Systems Agency, Danielle Metz is Principal Director for the Deputy Chief Information Officer for Information Enterprise at the Defense Department, and Doug Jones is the Chief Technology Officer of the Defense Group at Lidos. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. You're listening to Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com. Use the search term Lidos.